Do you think you've mastered physical examination skills? Let's put your knowledge to the test. In this trivia challenge, we'll cover four key areas of the physical exam, cardiovascular examination, respiratory examination, abdominal examination, and neurological examination. Each area includes three questions, one easy, one medium, and one hard, worth one, two, or three stars. You'll have a moment to think before we reveal the correct answer, along with a brief explanation from Lecturio's expert medical content. Keep score as you go and find out how strong your physical examination skills really are. Let's get started. A 62-year-old man is evaluated for exertional dyspnea. On auscultation, you hear a low-pitched extra sound immediately preceding S1. It is best heard at the apex with the bell of the stethoscope in the left lateral decubitus position. Which of the following is the most likely underlying pathophysiology? It's part of the atrial kick. What's happening when you hear an S4 is that the left ventricle has fully, uh, fully filled during diastole. You have diastolic filling. And at the end of diastole, the left atrium is contracting and spitting out that last volume of blood from the atrium, but it's hitting against a stiff left ventricular wall. A 20-year-old male collapses during basketball practice. On physical examination, a systolic murmur is heard best at the left lower sternal border. The murmur increases in intensity with Valsalva maneuver. Which of the following mechanisms explains this finding? So the Valsalva maneuver is when you ask your patient to basically bear down, almost as if they're having a bowel movement. And by exerting that abdominal pressure, uh, you're basically having the patient squeeze their upper chest against a closed glottis. So they're contracting all those muscles of respiration as if they're trying to forcefully uh, exude air, but since they have a closed glottis, all they're doing is dramatically increasing intrathoracic pressure. I said before that when you take a breath, you're decreasing intrathoracic pressure because you're creating a vacuum. This is the opposite. You're dramatically increasing intrathoracic pressure, and by doing so, you are preventing blood return to the heart. You're telling the IVC and the SVC to not deliver blood to the right side of the heart when you perform this maneuver. As such, you're decreasing blood to the right side of the heart. Eventually, that means less blood to the pulmonary vascular bed and then to the left side of the heart. So you're decreasing preload, decreasing venous return. So as I suggested before, for most murmurs, if you decrease the amount of blood running through the heart, that should decrease most murmurs, right? Less blood means less turbulent flow. But with hokum, what's happening in hokum is that the stenosis, the source of the murmur, is underneath the aortic valve. Down here, there's extra tissue in the either infantricular septum or elsewhere in the left ventricle that as the walls of the left ventricle get smaller with decreased preload, that stenotic area has now been brought closer together, which tightens the area through which blood needs to get out. So when you have a large heart, a dilated heart, by, with lots of blood going in there, those walls which were closing in are now separated, the murmur will be less. But as you do Valsalva, you're slowly decreasing the walls of that heart with each contraction, and now that turbulent flow around that bend in the interventricular septum, if you will, is now creating a louder murmur. During a cardiovascular exam, you notice splitting of S2 that becomes narrower during inspiration rather than wider. This finding is most consistent with which condition? So what happens is, if this is S1 here, mitral and tricuspid, and this is your S2, aortic and pulmonic. When the person takes a deep breath, the aortic and the pulmonic will actually separate, like so. Whew. Whew. 
And that's normal physiology. And that's driven by the fact that when you take a deep breath, you're creating a negative space in his chest that's actually drawing more blood to the right side of the heart. If there's more blood on the right side of the heart, it's gonna take longer for that pulmonic valve to close until the pulmonic valve moves farther away in time while the aortic valve stays largely in the same place. That's called physiologic splitting. We expect to hear that. When you're listening to the chest in this area, you should listen to make sure that when he's inspiring, when he's inhaling, those, uh, that second heart sound does split like that. In contrast, there are some instances where, for example, the aortic valve may actually uh, be displaced in time, particularly with a left bundle branch block. Now, if you have a left bundle branch block, the left ventricle is going to uh, contract later than it's supposed to. So rather than having your S1 here and your S2 here with aortic and pulmonic valve, these two are actually flipped, like so. The aortic valve is now over here and the pulmonic valve is here. So when this person takes a deep breath, the pulmonic valve moves over So what you're hearing is paradoxic. You're hearing during inspiration, the two heart sounds moving closer together. And that's because the pulmonic valve is moving the way it's supposed to, but the aortic valve is so delayed by the bundle branch block that you hear the pulmonic valve catching up with it during inhalation. When percussing the thorax of a healthy patient, which sound is most commonly expected over the lung fields? The next sound we were listening for is resonance. Resonance is the sound of a chorus of low pitch sounds throughout a tissue that is relatively hollow. It's not a hollow viscous, it's not a drum, but it is nonetheless airy and light. And that perfectly describes the chest, right? So let's take a listen to see what the sound of resonance sounds like. You'll note that my finger is typically, for most Physicians or clinicians, you're hitting the distal uh, segment of your middle digit. I'm keeping my other hands off the chest to avoid dampening down the sound. And that's the sound that I'm reproducing, which is a sound of resonance. In contrast, timpani is, since that also describes a particular drum in somebody's drum set, is a specific pitch and you're typically looking for timpani when you percuss over a hollow viscous. The stomach would be the most obvious example. When you percuss over the stomach, you'll actually hear one pitch. It's a hollow sounding sound, and it tends to have a longer duration, and it's lower in pitch depending upon the size of the viscous that you are percussing. In a patient with suspected unilateral pleural effusion, you percuss dullness at the lung base. Which finding on tactile fremitus would support a fusion rather than consolidation? I can clearly feel vibrations in my hands as I march up his, the back of his chest. In a patient who has, again, a significant lung consolidation, those sounds of, from, that are coming from his voice box, from his larynx, are now going to be accentuated as they pass through solid tissue. So you'll have increased tactile fremitus that'll be transmitted to my hands. In contrast, if he had an effusion in there, and remember, dullness to percussion is going to be the same whether it's an effusion, you know, fluid, or if it's a solid. So dullness to percussion can't tease those two things apart. But if there's a consolidation, you'll have increased tactile fremitus, whereas if there's fluid, those vibrations from his larynx are not going to be transmitted through fluid, so you would have decreased tactile fremitus. You auscultate a patient's lung fields and can clearly distinguish words spoken softly by the patient during whisper counting. What is this finding called, and what does it most strongly suggest? Now, normally, 
When you have a patient speak and you're trying to listen in the peripheral lung fields, you can't hear anything. It's just muffled kind of sounds. Certainly I'm hearing him vocalizing something, but I have no idea what is being said. I can't hear consonants or syllables or anything like that. When you can actually hear things more crisply, more, uh, more robustly, we call that bronchophony, bronchophony, which is basically that the bronchial sounds, we were talking before about bronchial breath sounds, which is the sound of vibrations from your voice box or from your airways going down the large airways out to your stethoscope. If you can hear actual words, the sound of people saying words, we call that bronchophony. And if you can hear it even more crisply, you can actually make out the words, we call that pectoriloquy. And this goes back to Rene Lenaik's descriptions of the lung sounds. He used the ancient Greek to describe pectoriloquy as chest talking. Remember, pect means, refers to the chest, the pectoralis muscles is the chest. Iloquy is from the same root as the word soliloquy, which is a person talking alone on stage. Well, pectoriloquy is the chest talking. And it's based on, that, on the idea that if I can hear somebody actually talking through my stethoscope, I'm hearing the chest talk. And the reason that that is a marker of disease is that it means that his voice box is vibrating when he's making words, and that sound is being transmitted through the large airways to some sort of solid tissue, again, a tumor or a pneumonia, that is conducting those vibrations directly through his chest wall right to my stethoscope. When is a positive Murphy sign elicited? So Murphy sign is based on the idea that the gallbladder is inflamed, but when she is in exhalation, the diaphragm is higher and the liver and the gallbladder are therefore higher up in the abdomen and towards the thorax. I'm gonna put my fingers down in this area now, and then I'm gonna have the patient take a deep breath. So take a deep breath for me. Now if while taking a deep breath, which again, her diaphragm is lowering the liver and the gallbladder towards my insulting fingers, if she abruptly stops taking that deep breath, that is, that is the Murphy's sign. It basically is an indication that by, by bringing her uh, gallbladder slowly towards my fingers, um, if it arrests her breath, um, then it suggests the presence of acute cholecystitis. What is it called when pain occurs in the right lower quadrant upon palpating the left lower quadrant? The diagnosis of appendicitis. Rob Singh's sign is the idea that if I push on this side and it causes pain over here, um, that also supports appendicitis, though somewhat less strongly. A man with chronic liver disease presents with white nail beds covering 80% of the nail plate with a reddish brown distal band. What is this finding called? Patients with cirrhosis um, oftentimes will have what's called teres nails, where 80% uh, of the nail plate is, has turned white, or leukonychia is present, and the distal nail uh, bed is um, kind of a reddish brown, so it's 80% white versus 20% uh, a reddish, uh, reddish brown in coloration. Which of the following images taken at rest most strongly suggests a right third cranial nerve palsy? And lastly, a patient with a third cranial nerve palsy, the oculomotor nerve, uh, since you've lost all of the other muscle groups and you have unopposed action of the lateral rectus muscles, a patient with a third nerve palsy will have their eyes, their eye, the affected eye, down and out. So heading off towards the lateral corner of their vision. When performing the head impulse test, which finding suggests a peripheral vestibular lesion?
And then I'm gonna quickly move your head in one direction. Good, and I want you to take note that his oculocephalic reflex is intact. No matter how quickly I move him, his eyes stay locked onto my nose. And if his eyes are staying locked onto my nose, I know that his vestibular nerve is functioning. In contrast, if a patient is having vertigo symptoms with or without nystagmus, they're going to misdirect, they're gonna, their eyes are going to follow the direction of the head, and they'll have to make a corrective saccade back to, um, back to my nose. In contrast, a person who's having a stroke, they have dual inputs. They have both sides of their head are working to make sure the oculocephalic reflex is working, and if the vestibular nerves are intact, they will also have a normal finding. So it's important to make sure you're just doing this test in someone who's actively having vertiginous symptoms. What is the term for the failure to identify objects by touch with eyes closed, despite intact primary sensory modalities? And where is it found? All right, so for stereognosia, I'm gonna basically have you close your eyes and put out your left hand. And I just want you to try and identify what that is in your hand. The house key. Perfect, that is a key. And now give me your right hand and see if you can identify what that is. Quarter. Perfect, now you got exactly, not that it's just a coin, but actually that's a quarter, so that's perfect. So the ability to take all the information, the sensory information and process it is the work of the parietal lobe. And that tells me that that's functioning well. And that's a wrap. How many stars did you earn? If you scored three to 12 stars, you're a physical exam rookie. Off to a great start on your learning journey. If you scored 13 to 25 stars, you're a physical exam pro. You've built a solid foundation. And if you scored 26 to 36 stars, congratulations. You're a physical exam master. No matter your level, keep sharpening your skills with Lecturio, your all-in-one study companion for success in clinical practice. Drop your score in the comments and let us know which physical exam area you want to tackle next.